Hello, I'm Respikias Gabagambi from Karagwe. Chacha Nyangi from Mara region. Glory Mhalu from Arusha, Tanzania, Africa. At Ohio State University, I researched the effectiveness of contract sugarcane farming so that contract farming in Tanzania can become more equitable and effective. At Sokoine University, I developed research that investigates the effectiveness of improved maize and beans storage so that farmers can reduce levels of myocotoxin and improve post-harvest yields. At Michigan State University, I developed a recipe that incorporates sweet potatoes into uji to increase vitamin A levels in young children so that Tanzanians can grow up healthy and happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the American people, USAID, and I agree, for the opportunity to make Tanzania food secure and prosperous. Thank you, Director hessler Radelit, for that wonderful presentation. There's been so much Peace Corps love here over the past three days. It's, it's been remarkable. So it's a perfect way to help us start to, start to wind down the day. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome our next panel on the stage um, while I uh, introduce our distinguished moderator. The next panel is Feed the Future Forward, the Next Generation. Um, and this panel will be moderated by Julie Borlaug. Um, Ms. Borlaug is the granddaughter of Norman E. Borlaug and the Associate Director of External Relations at the Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture at Texas A&M. Ms. Borlaug has furthered her grandfather's legacy and expanded upon his mission to feed the world's hungry by developing agricultural partnerships between public, private, and philanthropic groups. We look forward to this great panel. Please take it away. Good afternoon. Um, you realize they put the best panel at the end of the day, so we're glad the room is full. Um, I'm not going to give you too much background because Jada just gave me a great introduction. I do want to tell you that um, I have a five and a half year old son and he graduated from preschool today. He'll graduate again tomorrow. But they, <laughs> they asked him, and, and the video was sent to me, but they asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up. They asked all the kids doctor, lawyer, he wants to be a tractor driver. So, we will have a hunger for another Borlaug involved in agriculture. <laughs> um, as many of you know, my grandfather was a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, Medal of Freedom, the Congressional Gold Medal, and a new statue at the U.S. Capitol. Please go see it. Um, however, he could never have achieved any of this had it not been for the young hunger fighters, the scientists and the farmers he trained. And when he accepted his um, Nobel Peace Prize, he didn't accept it on his behalf. He accepted it on the behalf of the thousands of hunger fighters who really made the Green Revolution such a success. And much like my grandfather's Green Revolution, we have a huge challenge in front of us, how we're gonna feed nine billion by 2050. I don't need to go into what that challenge is. We all know that really well. But the challenge will require new economic and political policies, new rounds of innovation and technology in um, engineering, medicine, health, but most important, agriculture. And it will, will require a new way of address, addressing these challenges. And it'll also depend on this next generation of hunger fighters, the entrepreneurs, the scientists, policymakers, and the farmers. And these hunger fighters must, uh, embrace technology, innovation, creativity, and bold ideas. They are our future. So I'm honored to be here today to share the stage with three great examples of hunger fighters and those of the next generation. We're gonna discuss what they're doing, but also how we in the audience can mentor, inspire, and encourage more to join in the fight against hunger. Before I um, move it over to the panel, I do wanna thank USAID for all they're doing to continue my um, grandfather's legacy. There's the Borlaug LEAP program, and I know you got to hear from Mary the other day, and I've had the honor of going out to Kenya and see her program. We have, um, I even get confused, and I'm gonna Borlaug on all these names, but we have the Borlaug Global Summer Institute at um, 
Purdue, which is a great, great program. And then we also have, and this is the hardest one for me to remember, Be Heard, which is the Borlaug Higher Education for Agricultural Research and Development program. So I thank USAID for your support. And then, as always, the USDA Borlaug Fellows Program is such a great program. So I'm going to um, turn it over to our panel. We have Ryan King, who's already been introduced, but he's Feed the Future Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia. And I just learned he went into agriculture because of my grandfather. So I just learned that, so that's exciting. Um, we have Kasum Hachetu from Nepal. She's at Tufts University, and she represents the Chicago Council of Global Affairs Next Generation Delegates that are here in town for the big meeting tomorrow. And then we have Nahid Sitar, who's from Bangladesh, and he is from the Be Heard program. So he's gonna share some of his exciting um, programs and what he's doing. So I'm gonna turn it over to you all. Will each one of you just give us a little background and why you're involved in food security? You wanna start? Okay. Uh, as, as she said, I'm a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia, but before I did that, I, uh, my family, when I was about eight years old, purchased a cranberry bog in Massachusetts. Um, they're not farmers by trade, but it, it was a hobby farm, a way to monetize their vacation home in Cape Cod, really. <laughs> Um, but they put me in charge of it for the 30-acre cranberry farm once I got to about the age of 15, and I managed it every year throughout college um, and, and saw it grow and the satisfaction that that brought. Um, that experience, in combination with other international experiences, led me to Peace Corps, um, where I was selected uh, to join Peace Corps' efforts in Ethiopia. Uh, I was placed in the northern highlands of Amhara, 6,000 feet above sea level. Not a lot of cranberries growing there, but uh, we learned. Um, over the course of my two years there, I, uh, I trained 400 households on home-scale gardening and 200 American volunteers on the methods that I used to train those very households. After finishing my service, I extended my service with Peace Corps in Ethiopia to help facilitate the furthering of the Feed the Future mission in Ethiopia, and I am very, very glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, okay. um, so I am a public health nutritionist. I just graduated three days ago from... Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just graduated from the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Food Policy. Um, I have a master's in food policy and applied nutrition, and. I specialize in international nutrition interventions, the design of it, operation and management of it. Um, so I, I, I've worked with UNICEF in Nepal in community, in their community management of acute malnutrition program, CMAM program. And I have also worked with Feed the Future Nutrition Innovation Lab as a research assistant. Um, so connection in there. And I'm really interested in integrated interventions uh, through nutrition sensitive and nutrition specific programming. So that's where food insecurity comes in. Um, talking about my story, I, I grew up in Nepal. And um, as many of you know, a country with um, a lot of political, economic and social problems. And I I grew up there. I grew up there, but um, in the city. But I got to travel around rural parts of Nepal with my father, who is a professor of political science. So whenever I got the chance, I would travel with him around rural parts of Nepal. We would hike for days to reach a certain village, and over there, I saw people in extreme poverty. I saw that people have to hike down the hill for days just to go to the market and buy salt. And I saw the consequences of food insecurity and malnutrition even when I was very young. And I knew I wanted to be in the development field. I didn't know what exactly, but I knew I wanted to work for development. And um, so yeah, and I was very much inspired by my father who is in academia and he does a lot of research and survey in the political science side of it, and um, that's him. he's my biggest motivation, and he always inspires me to work towards my goal. 
that's Nepal side of it. And uh, I came to US for my undergraduate. I went to a liberal arts school in Illinois. And, and since I was in the liberal arts school, I was taking a variety of courses in economics and politics and science. And that really um, allowed me to look at things in an inter interdisciplinary manner and really allowed me to look at problems in a multi-sectoral lens. And, and yeah, that's how it all started. And it's just the beginning. I really hope to be in this sector and contribute positively to the sector. Hi, uh, I'm currently a PhD student in agricultural economics at Michigan State University under the BHIRT program. And uh, back home, uh, I'm a lecturer in agricultural economics in Bangladesh Agriculture University. And regarding like how I have got interested in food security issues, I mean, I have always been fascinated by the, in facing the challenge of food security that my country, my home country, Bangladesh faces. I mean, so many of the issues are there we have been discussing. So uh, I was really uh, interested in uh, fighting against those obstacles, against those barriers. And um, I also had a desire to remain within the academia and my father is an agricultural scientist, uh, so I was aware of the prospects uh, um, uh, within the academia for agriculture. So uh, when I passed the high school, uh, when I was going to university, I chose to study agriculture economics, uh, even though I had opportunities, options to study business or engineering or uh, other, other things. So that's basically how I became interested, and since I succeeded as a student, I remained within the academia. And uh, it's a pleasure to me, for me to be here in this panel. Thank you. We're going to go through a few more questions, and then we're going to open it to audience questions. So please um, be jotting some ideas down. I'm going to um, direct this question to Kasum and Nahid. And it's, what are the challenges and opportunities you see engaging youth and bringing people in to pursue careers in agriculture and then getting them interested in food security? So I'll, I'll start with challenges and then I'll move on to opportunities. Um, I, I think one of the biggest challenges in getting young people involved in the field of agriculture and food insecurity is the monetary disincent disincentive. Mm -hmm. At least I can speak for Nepal and, and I know parents over there don't want their children to be um, in this field. It's not as reputed as um, technical fields or science-based science, science fields like Parents want their children to be doctors and engineers and to be making money. And even farmers don't want their um, kids to, be, to remain in the farm. They want their children to take up other positions. So really young people are moving out of farms. And I'll, I'll just give a recent example. So three days ago, during my graduation, my aunt called me and she said, so you've just graduated, you have jobs lined up. And I said, I'll be looking for jobs, I just graduated. And then she goes, why don't you do another master's in IT? I heard there's a lot of scope and money in information technology. So, so yeah, so, and this is coming from a very well-educated woman and, and this kind of attitude does prevail. And just to let you know, I would not be taking the advice. <laughs> <laughs> as well-intentioned as it was. <laughs> But yeah, this is this this is the biggest challenge right there. And um, the other challenge I think is um, the lack of higher institutions really focusing on agriculture and food insecurity. And again, I can speak for Nepal. There's only one university, the um, Agriculture and Forest Forestry University, that. Uh, really focuses in in the subject, and that too suffers from a lot of institutional problems, a lot of financial problems. Um, I had interacted with students from the university uh, three years ago, and, and so they told me that they, I, I found out through my interaction that they were doing a lot of great research, developing drought resistant crops and whatnot, but they really did not have the financial support to take a next step uh, forward. They, they didn't have forms like this to share their um, their research uh, findings and things like that. So that, I think, is another, um, another big um, challenge in terms of um, in, in, on the institutional side. And um, speaking of opportunities, I do 
Um, I do think that there's a lot of opportunities for young people to be involved in this field, especially in recent years. And Peace Corps is a great example. Uh, Feed the Future is a great example. And um, I, I worked as a research assistant for Nutrition Innovation Lab, which is part of um, Feed the Future. And, and I know that Nutrition Innovation Lab has supported um, young professionals um, from the host countries to undertake short-term courses in sorry, agriculture and food insecurity. And um, they host annual symposiums, forums, and workshops. And students really benefit a lot from um, such avenues. And um, the other example that I always like to give is that is um, young people, is that young people are really um, coming up with innovative ways to be involved in food insecurity and agriculture. Um, two of my friends who studied in the US and Venezuela, they study agriculture, they went back to Nepal and they established a school called Maya Universe Academy. So this school provides free education to underprivileged kids in rural Nepal, and they've scaled up very rapidly. So their model is that they provide free education, and the parents come into school and produce fruits and vegetables in the farms, and the fruits and vegetables are sold in the market to support the school. So this is just one example, and there are many examples like this, and um, yeah, the young people have especially our generation is very um, creative, very passionate, and we're very good with working in team, and, and it's, it's a great opportunity. Well, first of all, uh, the way I see it is the younger generation in my country and maybe um, most other developing countries are on an average higher educated compared to the previous generations, and they have better technical know-how, better technical knowledge. So their involvement in agriculture is a very good thing. I mean, the more they get involved, we have a different agriculture. We have an increase in the total productivity, and there are many benefits to that. But it's true uh, because of the reasons uh, Kusum mentioned that the, we see that a lot of uh, people are moving away from agriculture. But uh, I think that's more in the case of uh, field crop production. But in my country, what I see that there are more and more people, younger people, who are interested in other uh, sec uh, sections of the agricultural system, like uh, uh, livestock, poultry, fisheries. I think the, the, in Bangladesh, the poultry and the aqu aquaculture sector has grown uh, over the last few decades, and the younger generation have played a major role in, in doing that. They're better receivers of technology, so it's easier to uh, for them to maybe uh, practice those things which are more technology intensive. So, of course, there are constraints, uh, there are uh, institutional <laughs> barriers to that, but I see that uh, the younger generation have also great potential in engaging in like agro-processing and uh, agribusiness. So there, there is opportunity for younger people to engage in different parts of the agricultural system. Thank you. Ryan, we've just heard from Kerry about how the Peace Corps is engaging the next generation. Can you give us your experience of what you're doing with the Peace Corps in Ethiopia and how you're engaging future food security leaders? I'd love to. Uh, using Feed the Future funds, Peace Corps Ethiopia has uh, arrived at three goals of how we're going to address uh, our Feed the Future portion of the mission. Uh, the first goal, is we're going to try and increase the number of household gardens and their productivity. Uh, that is usually aimed at mothers um, and with young children. Uh, the second goal is increasing the number of environmentally sustainable stewardship practices like planting trees, uh, fuel efficient stoves. That, that is a community wide effort and it, it really engages youth and adults. But the third, the third goal really targets youth. Um, we, we believe in education. Um, and the primary means by which Ethiopia is trying to achieve that education is through camps. Uh, Peace Corps, in general, has a great success working with uh, USAID PEPFAR in Camp GLOW. We have 30,000 uh, students attending Camp GLOW's in the fiscal year 2013. 94% uh, of posts have Camp GLOW. 
We at Peace Corps Ethiopia are piloting a program called Camp Grow. And what Camp Glow is to PEPFAR, Camp Grow is to Feed the Future. Uh, it is an eight week camp, just like Camp Glow is, uh, where we try to bring in rural students, uh, ages 13 through 18, uh, who are leaders in their community, or stand out individuals in their community. Uh, usually club leaders, people who have, have made themselves leaders in their classrooms, their teachers recommend them. It's a highly competitive process to get into this uh, camp. It's conducted entirely in English, uh, and it focuses 100% on Feed the Future, but also utilizing uh, missions like volunteerism and leadership, along with gardening and nutrition. The, vol the volunteers bring two campers, and usually what we like to call is a counterpart, which is from the Ministry of Agriculture or a local NGO, um, to facilitate. In combination with, uh, with those counterparts, we train these students over a course of a week, and then we bring them back to our communities. Uh, at those communities, we encourage them to create a club. It was talked about beforehand, the impact of this in Senegal. The, the, the clubs are then a means for those students who we've trained to be our own extension agents, to further the mission. And with our help, continue what we've been doing there. So that's, that, that's the primary means by which we're engaging youth. Well, thank you. Nahid, um, technology and innovation are so important to food security and also encouraging the next generation to participate. Can you give us a little about your experience in Bangladesh with, with technology and innovation and how it's helping? I think uh, what we have seen is uh, there has been t technological innovation in many dimensions in Bangladesh, but I, I would like to rather highlight the ICT sector within that. It's like the ICT sector has really grown o over the last few decades in Bangladesh. I mean, the, we have one of the highest mobile penetration rates in the world. Uh, and then it's not just the basic services, but there are other value-added services which are beneficial for agriculture, some call centers, uh, I mean, uh, helplines which where farmers can call and get information. Um, uh, there are a lot of websites who, who are dis giving information where farmers can learn, uh, l learn a lot about agriculture. They can ask questions, they can get answers. But uh, again, as, as you see that the, the ICT is giving uh, cheap information uh, to, the, to the farmers. But it's more, again, these technologies are more, the younger generation are in a better position to use those technologies. I know of an initiative by, under the Feed the Future, uh, US government initiative of, uh, um, by the USAID in Bangladesh that they're trying to develop uh, mobile apps for uh, disseminating extension information. Mm -hmm. like, uh, but you'd see that this is something that people for younger generation would be use, uh, able to use rather than um, uh, people from maybe past generations. So I think the more we can do these sort of things, the more uh, we can uh, modernize the technological uh, aspects, I think we will get more the younger people interested in agriculture. So I think that's something we should look forward to. Brian, do you want to add anything with your experiences with? Yeah. Peace Corps Ethiopia really highlights appropriate technology, and we like to refer to it as compact, local, organic, small, easy solutions to problems. Very close solutions to problems. The, the idea being that if, if everything that you use to solve a problem is in the community and is easily achievable by that community, then the scale up and scale out can be done by that community. Uh, a good examples of that would be like, instead of using drip irrigation systems, we use water bottles perforated and buried. Or instead of um, planting carrots with a planter, we mix carrot seeds with sand and hand plant um, because the sand spaces the carrots equally well. Um, things like that, very low tech solutions, but using things that they have in their communities in ways they've never used them before uh, is an incredible opportunity. Thank you. I think we'd like to take um, three questions from the audience, and there are microphones that are going to be around the room, so who would like to go first? And I know many of you in the room, so if no one stands up, I will just call on you. 
<laughs> so do we have anyone who would like to ask this panel some great questions? This is the most exciting panel, come on. Well, I'm gonna do, oh good. Rob Bergstrom, you just got out of a question. <laughs> yes, please, we have, a, no, Rob was gonna be my victim, but we do have a question right here. Okay, uh, Sayer again from the Ministry of Agriculture. I am the Ag Extension uh, Director. But what I want to mention is that, first of all, I, I, I'm really um, committed with what Peace Corps volunteers do because uh, I was a trainer for Peace Corps volunteers in Honduras for four years. So, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but second, what my question is, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of um, potential uh, youth people in our communities that um, most of them really need some guidance. And uh, right now the government has this program of, of making 500 um, like people that are just about graduating from high school or some other to go and be with them for four months and three months. So we really, if you have a, like um, some support that you can give us to improve this, this program, that, that really help because um, I think what we want is that whatever we are doing with the farmers, uh, you know, with the communities in terms of how to share knowledge in terms of agriculture, well, we want to do it also with the youth people in terms of, of something to their level, but to commit themselves to stay in the community rather than probably come to the, by even legal means to, to USA. So that will be wonderful. Thanks a lot. Do you have any comments? I, I don't know if I'm directly answering your question, but um, along the same lines, I think Peace Corps is a great example, and if more countries can have something like similar to that, I think it would be great. I, I would have loved to do Peace Corps, but I couldn't do it because I'm not a US citizen. <laughs> but um, some, even in developing countries, you know, something similar to Peace Corps, I think um, would benefit a lot even um, students from even exchange programs, lesson learned from, from a developing country in Africa, you know, can be applied to Nepal. So something like that would, it would be very beneficial to engage young people. Thank you, Ryan, I think you'd like to address this. Yeah, two points. Uh, first, I'd like to highlight the efforts of the AAU to create Africa Corps um, mm -hmm. in the lines of Peace Corps and allow Africans to volunteer in other African countries. I think that's a very noble effort, um, especially because they are largely based on Peace Corps' good principles. Uh, the, the second is, I think, community engagement, community ownership. Uh, we need a sense of volunteerism to be created in, 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 in the developing world. Uh, it, it encourages me to see young people, especially, come to these camps, get an education on a particular topic and then go back to their communities and engage with the elders, engage with their communities, uh, and, and really take that message home. Those are the future leaders. Those are your future extension agents. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to, that's when you need to hit them. From the ages of 13 to 18, that's when their formative years of how they're thinking is really impacted. I encourage education in that, in that, in that realm to answer that very question. Great answer. Yes, we have another question. Hi, I'm Rosh Lakhtar. I'm from USAID Bangladesh. Um, uh, I have a comment like we were on women participation in agriculture. And women are in the developing countries, women are participating a lot, but their contribution is unrecognized. And they are behind because they have less access to innovation, information, and finance, credit. And um, while we think of, uh, when we are thinking of uh, engaging future generation in agriculture, I think we should give more thought, more, um, you know, focus on engaging more women in agriculture. So that, you know, um, women can come forward and they can be more engaged in agriculture and they can contribute fully with their full potential. Thank you. On women in agriculture? 
Yeah, sure. I would ask the two gentlemen, <laughs> but I don't think it's appropriate for that topic. Yeah. So would you like yeah, to? Yeah, sure. Please? Because you Definitely, represent. Yeah, getting back to the technology, as, as Ryan mentioned, um, I think getting the right technology easy um, easy, simple technology that women can use, for example, hand tractors. Sorry, I don't know what it's called. Like, um, I've seen women using tractors that you can run by hands, and it, it's, it's, it's been uh, run by reno renewable energy. So those kind of innovation can um, really uh, leverage more women to work in the farms. And even it doesn't necessarily just have to be the farm also. Um, studying, taking subjects like studying food insecurity and agriculture, and as I mentioned before, there's really not um, that many institutions focused in the subject, and even, even, even the ones that does exist, it's, it's highly dominated by men for some reason. So, yeah. That's <laughs> we have time for one more brief um, question before we go to the panel for um, has a question. You alluded to um, several in different interventions for young people, but what can we do to make agriculture cool? It's a problem in our country here, <laughs> and it's a problem all over the world. And I, what can we do to make it cool again? That is a great question, because we just talked about how everyone wants to make agriculture sexy. And we I don't have an answer yet. It's always talked about, I wish I had an answer. And, Ryan, what do, you, what do you think? I think in the United States, trying to encourage uh, a linkage between sustainable agriculture and the environmental movement that's happening in, 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 in the United States and in the Western world, linking those two, saying that without sustainable agriculture, no matter how many CFLs we install, it's not going to matter. Um, it, that, that kind of linkage, because uh, the younger generation is very passionate about it, um, I think we have a chance to leverage that interest and, and shape it towards agriculture. Um, I know most of the volunteers in my cohort feel that the shift from environment volunteers to agriculture volunteers was a very natural one. Great. I think that's a great answer. Um, I am going to go to our closing statements real quickly, and it's really in the form of a question. So we have a room full of government officials, policy makers, private sector. If you could tell them something they can do to contribute to engaging the next generation and opportunities that they could create or any way to really support what you are doing and others are doing, what would you tell them? I'm going to start with Mahid. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I've become very hopeful uh, in attending this uh, whole event because I see a lot of effort being a lot of a attention being given to agriculture. I mean, a lot of questions being asked. Maybe we don't know the answer to all the questions. But regarding what uh, I would like to call upon the, I mean, the leaders of uh, agriculture today is like help build institutions, education, research, or market institutions in our countries, which, uh, which can take the agriculture sector ahead, I and mean, when I say build institutions, I mean enrich the human capital, I mean strengthen the, the physical infrastructure and ensure good governance in those institutions. And I think the correct decisions by the leaders in agriculture today, uh, like the Feed the Future initiative and other initiatives like the Be Heard program, I think that can really help uh, leaders of our generation to really fight against hunger uh, in the long run. I'd just like to um, uh, reiterate what I said before. I think our generation is really, this is on the positive side, our, our generation is really fully embedded in working together as a team to use our skills and tools to really come up with um, prob solutions to complex problems. And um, really this uh, together, if we work together across disciplines, we have the ability to come up with innovative solutions to food, food insecurity and agriculture problems around the globe. And we, what we really need um, is learning forms like this. We need more investment in research and development and 
and capacity building, both human capacity and institutional capacity. And we need more institutions providing holistic and multidisciplinary education in food insecurity, agriculture, and nutrition. Friedman School is a great example. Um, yeah, we, and for all this, we need a collaborative support from the whole country government, from the private sector, and from the US government. And with this, we can create this pool of national and international youth experts who, can, who will really um, sustain and scale up innovative interventions um, towards food insecurity, agriculture, and a lot of other complex social economic problems. And just to conclude, I would just like to again reiterate that um, human capacity is really the key to really um, foster the next generation of leaders. Thank, Thank you. you. Ryan. Yeah, I, I, I think we should all recognize the iterative nature of our, our work, that, that things are rarely perfect when they are first conceived um, in aid. Uh, implementation takes time, and there are errors and bumps along the way. I think sharing those bumps and sharing the lessons learned uh, with the younger generation so that we're not repeating the same mistakes mm -hmm. is absolutely crucial. I think we need to remove a lot of the gatekeepers uh, to ideas. Uh, we need to embrace uh, ideas coming from the <coughs> developing world uh, and the Western world, uh, both in innovation and technology, but also just basic uh, implementation. Um, overall, I think just sharing the experiences of working in this field with each other, learning from each other, is the best advice I could give to all of you here in working with you. Thank you. I'd like to add a little something. Um, the role of all of you as mentors is so important, and my grandfather firmly believed that it was up to us to mentor the next generation, give them a voice, and help them move forward. So I would appeal to you to do that. And I wish my grandfather was here because when he made these asks, most people couldn't say no. And I know um, Raj had quite a few experiences with him. But everyone in this room, in some way or shape, has the opportunity to provide these great programs or anything like this for students. Whether you're affecting one or 300, I just ask that you take the time to do that and really make a difference. So I want to thank all of you for being here today. I want to thank our Next Generation panel. They are the future. They're going to have these answers. And we thank you for supporting them.